grabando. Well, we are here today, joined together, Sebastián Salgado, Cristian Nader, Tina Anderson, and Mark Maos. Uh, all of us are uh, trying to talk uh, a little bit about the situation, not only in Caracas, Venezuela, but in the rest of the world, uh, in the anti-imperialism moment, so crucial, so important. This uh, turning point, this uh, real turning point of the world going to a multipolar world, that a real uh, fair play world with the game uh, that is the Western uh, rules based uh, in, in wars are changing uh, to a new Asiatic uh, rules based in the sovereignty of all the countries. Well, here we are with Marwa. Marwa is living in the nuclear point of the world now near Palestine and with a moment uh, very, very urgent with uh, Lebanon, a Beirut, uh, and, and Hezbollah and, uh, and the resistance of the Palestinian people. And then we want to know uh, some, some of this. We are in Venezuela. You can talk about Venezuela also, but, but also we are very, very interested in knowing how is it uh, the moment for Palestinian people or for your... Yes. targeted any civilians despite the fact that he has every right to because Zionist Israel has killed so far 700 people in Lebanon, 400 fighters and the remaining 300 are civilians. So we have every right to reciprocate uh, and counter attacks but that was not the case because since the beginning of the war, especially the last four months, the Iron Dome has been failing desperately especially in uh, Majd al-Shams and you can find videos online that would uh, give uh, evidence of what I'm talking of the failed missiles that were being launched and were fired uh, by mistake on Majd al-Shams. So that was just another failure in the Iron Dome and the Israelis at the beginning they themselves in breaking news that the uh, uh, Israeli army radio initiated a statement saying that it was a failed Iron Dome but then an hour later, everyone was on board the same narrative that it was Hezbollah. He attacked children. He's been, why would they attack a town when they have been for the past 10 months targeting only military sites? Military sites that would 100% uh, hurt the Zionist entity. Why would they want to hurt their own people in Golan Heights? Uh, so, uh, despite the fact that Hezbollah issued a statement, Hezbollah was very fast in also issuing a warning, saying that in case this false flag attack is used by Zionist Israel to bomb Lebanon, because Israel is saying it's going to bomb Beirut and the suburbs of Beirut, Hezbollah said one strike, one drone, or one bullet falls on Lebanon and the capital Beirut, we will reciprocate. We will fire back on Tel Aviv the same way to the same places that they target. 
So a lot of people diplomatically have been working on it, especially in France and the United States of America. And I was just reading now that uh, there was a statement by the State Department when they were asked if they will issue a warning for the American citizens living in Lebanon to leave. They said, no, we're not going to issue that warning because you had Saudi Arabia, uh, Sweden, and a couple of other uh, countries yesterday, at, at least five countries issued statements uh, telling their, uh, their uh, residents to leave uh, Lebanon. And for some period of time, there were a lot of flights canceled into Beirut International Airport in fear that Zionist Israel would bomb it. But uh, this morning, things have uh, lightened up a bit. Even some major uh, news media outlets like the New York Times and the Washington Post doubled down on their uh, agenda, which they portrayed yesterday, saying that Hezbollah struck uh, Majd al-Shams. Today, they're saying that there is a possibility that this was an Iron Dome. We knew from day one, like the first 15 minutes, because the resistance said so. And, and they, by the way, the resistance in 2006 did launch certain missiles and they landed in Naharia on Palestinian Arabs. And the resistance back then apologized and sent a message to the families of these people and told them, please leave the areas of um, contact because we don't know where the missile will fall. But we are at a time where Hezbollah knows exactly where every missile is falling. It's a guided missile. So there's no error. There's no, there's no place or uh, um, space for error in this case, especially because it was in the heart of the town. So it was obviously a failed uh, Iron Dome missile. But the threats that are being initiated at the moment by Zionist Israel were repeatedly uh, denounced by Hezbollah and by the Lebanese uh, foreign ministry as well, by the Lebanese government, saying that any form of attack will be taken very, very seriously. Now, there are certain Arab uh, treacherous media like Al Hadath uh, TV that issued reports saying that tonight is the night that Israel will strike Lebanon. We don't have evidence of that, but there's evidence that from Wednesday until Sunday, from Wednesday, August, um, uh, July 31st, till Sunday, uh, the first week of August, uh, the uh, Naharia train station will be uh, shut down. So the question is why? And Naharia is very close to South Lebanon. So the question would be, why would they choose to shut down this train station from Wednesday to Sunday? It means that throughout that period, they might most probably might strike uh, Lebanon. And for me, I believe it's going to be a very big mistake, not only because I'm Lebanese from South Lebanon, but because I fully believe the threats issued by the resistance in Lebanon that it will reciprocate any attack that it falls on. Well, uh, I think that uh, this uh, moment it's a moment that uh, where uh, where the the media, the orchestrated, the orchestrated media, uh, that is uh, with the direction of uh, USA, uh, Netanyahu go and re and receive an applause, a big applause of the of the great Parliament of the United States of America, and he comes back with the new baptism of the great leader that he is for them. And then all this orchestrated media is in reality for the scenic uh, rules of the world. At the same time, is an orchestrated media with these absurd ideas of this attack uh, the, uh, is in, re in reality for the domestic consume of the USA citizens. They only need uh, to convince them, the domestic city, because the Europe is going to do what they want. And then, what do you think about this? Is is maybe an occasion again for confront this? Yes, I think um, in this uh, situation uh, we shouldn't forget uh, that United States is having presidential elections, and if uh, Donald Trump uh, will win, maybe they will have to shut down the NATO war against the Russian Federation in Ukraine. So I think uh, the military industry is very uh, worried about that. So they always uh, need at least uh, one big war going around. And it seems that the Middle East, it would be the next point in which the United States will push somehow uh, Israel to fight against uh, all the Muslim and Arab countries in, in that area. But at the same time, um, 
We have seen how uh, Yemen is fighting back. We have seen how Hezbollah is fighting back. And we would like to see what uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is going to do about this. So uh, this uh, situation between the Zionist regime and the Palestinians in Gaza, it seems that it's going to spread somehow in, in the region. Uh, so from, from my point of view, that even could have been the, the end of Israel in the way we have uh, known that uh, regime until now. I think they are running away forward, don't you think so? They are running away forward, in some way they are uh, trying to escape uh, but going in advance to, um, to spreading the world, to, for spreading the world. I think it's the final phase of the by Ang Anglo supremacy period in the last 500 years. Well, Euro Euro European or um, Euro descent supremacy of the last 500 years. Con concretamente, uh, the Anglo Anglo speaking empires, first the British, then American, and they and, and the, at this point. They are, they, are, they are able to, to really try to borrow the, all the world to maintain the supremacy, their hegemonic power. And we have seen things that, well, we saw, it, we saw them before, but not the, at the same rate of time. I mean, in the last nine months, we have seen in, in, multiple, in, in multiple parts of the world and a level of violence without precedent, even for the United States and even for global imperialism. Uh, the case of Ukraine against trying to uh, empantanar to the Russian Federation in a forever war. That's one century. We go to Palestine. I mean, the process against Palestine start, started a century ago, 76 uh, years ago. But uh, what began nine, ten, nearly 10 months ago, it's a phase of violence that we are, we are seeing a genocide uh, with cameras in live moment, it's terrible, it's brutally, and this has it, this is a response of the crisis that imperialism is well living, not not just in the Middle East, not just in the Mediterranean, in the Maghreb, but also in Latin America, in Venezuela, where we are right now. There's a they're living a moment of prosperity. They begin their economy to restructure their, their economy. So, uh, a partir de eso. We, we must consider that uh, the America are losing the Monroe Doctrine. The, Mon the Monroe Doctrine is more uh, is threatened because we are making connections from Venezuela, from Latin America, from the poles of resistance to other parts of the world that are also resisting against American imperialism and their satellites and their puppets in the re in the region. We have so many examples. The case of the case of Chile, it's terrible. It's brutal with Boric, and also the case, for example countries like like Colombia. Colombia, they have to, to make a choice. You're with the resistance or you're against them. Because the case of Petro is more, very similar. Petro has, has a vivido, he has been living a period of instability because of the propaganda against him. But now he's taking the, the same propaganda against the Venezuelan government. That's very strange. It is, no? So I think this moment is uh, decisive, decisive para todo for all, for all my kind, man, mankind, but con concretamente for the global south. I think it's a more important thing. And we're making the connections, and we, I, think, I think it's a global resistance against, against imperialism. Uh, Tim Anderson is an intellectual uh, that knows very, very well the area, the song, and uh, is always in this cultural world uh, for the anti-imperialism. Uh, the axis of, of anti-imperialism now is spreading also, not only the war, the axis of the resistance countries. And then, uh, do you think the moment of truth is coming for the Zionists or, and, uh, and the, the, this accelerated, this speeded up of, of, living, of uh, Zionists now with Netanyahu is uh, possible uh, the dead end for him? In English. Yes, in English. Yes, I think the, the, the contradictions of the regime are ripening, as they say. That the, uh, the internal weakness, the, the, the collapse of international support, 
the collapse of the Israeli military and its reliance on international support, the big campaigns which are weakening the political will to keep arming that regime, those things are all um, increasing and at the same time there's a, a really uh, a unique regional co cooperation going on. We haven't seen the cooperation between the Yemeni resistance and the Iraqi resistance before. We haven't seen Iran directly striking the Israeli regime. We are only seeing the beginnings of the Lebanese resistance uh, uh, attacking the Israeli military. So, and of course, no one expected the degree of uh, success that the, the guerrilla fighters in, in, uh, in Gaza would have in the south of the Israeli regime. So, all of these factors are coming together, and of course, this means many things are unknown, but nevertheless, the ripening of those contradictions is certainly the case. And really, uh, the international support has abandoned in many respects the Israeli regime, or looking for ways out, at least, let's say. The US has maintained its support for its colony um, so far, uh, despite the fact that there's a collapse in the internal support amongst the youth there, but the Europeans are all looking for their way out in different ways. You've seen that yourself, of course, that the they're trying to paper over it and pretend that they are at arm's length from this genocidal regime. So all of those contradictions are, are ripening. In a way, we don't see exactly what will happen. I myself suspect that the internal uh, problems, the internal lack of cohesion is a major factor which may lead to a collapse of the Israeli regime. But then we'll be looking at a reconstruction of an Israeli regime by its key sponsors, the British and the US. And that may be a set of compromises which will uh, create a lot of surprise and a lot of um, attract a lot of attention, but require a lot of focus by the resistance to make sure that there aren't very serious compromises embedded in Israel Mark II, if there is an Israel Mark II. Right. Uh, finally, uh, well, you can ask whatever you want to her, but uh, my last question, after you can uh, ask her something, but my last question is, uh, do you know Marwa, that Iran change of presidency was used by some people in the Western media to say, well, now it's not the same. We can go and westernize this presidency in some way. We, yes, you and me laugh at, at, at it mm -hmm. at all, but... The but, issue <laughs> is, look, um, Chema, the first letter that uh, was sent by the president, President Bezishvian, before he even uh, took office was sent to Hezbollah leader Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah. What are they talking about? The elections that happen in Iran, they happen under the auspices of the leader of the Islamic Revolution. Whoever is to be elected is under the auspices of the principles of the Islamic Revolution. It's not someone being installed by the yes or else the people will not vote for them because the revolution is the people. But saying that if it's an Islahi or it's a, a reformist or if it's a conservative, that's a preference for the people. And uh, by the way, Dr. Bezeshkian is a has a, a, a history in politics, and not, he's not only a heart surgeon, but he has a history in policy because he was a member of parliament, and people loved him, and people saw how he served the public equally, not necessarily a reformist or a conservative. But at the same time, uh, when people say, oh, the conservatives lost, but if they look in details about the election process in Iran, they could see that the, the, um, the mishap that happened was that Khalibab did not uh, uh, like uh, leave the elections or leave the candidacy for uh, Dr. Jalili. If that had happened, the voices, the voting process, the voters would not have been split between Jalili and Khalibab. And the, the difference, the percentile difference is very, very uh, close, which means that it is uh, a, a choice by the people. And there was some sort of mishaps in the first uh, round of elections. But that's okay, because everything is under the auspices of the leader. And yes, just last night, uh, Sayyid Ali Khamenei, the leader of the revolution, was uh, at the inauguration of President Bezesh Liyan and gave a speech uh, during that uh, inauguration. And, uh, it was compatible between both men's speeches. So what are they talking about? People who talk like that really have no idea how the system inside of Iran works and how the institutions are really independent institutions. 
how there's elections at all levels and how uh, things when they are uh, played on an internal level they don't necessarily mean that it will be the same at an external level at the level of the foreign ministry the first thing that was issued by the foreign ministry that gaza should have a ceasefire and palestine should be liberated that's coming from the new president so what's the change about the foreign policy yeah, that yeah. everyone's talking about? Nothing. Change inside of Iran, that's their right to do the changes that they see fit because they were elected by the people. Very, there is not a weakening position, there is a strong position. Actually, it's a strong position telling how much of that this system, how much of a winning system it is, how much of a successful system it is. Because if that was not the case, people would have not voted and uh, maybe the conservatives, the conservatives would have won and we would have heard another tune saying that the elections were rigged but now they're saying oh a new power things will change things will change on the inside as they should because iran is under sanctions from the west and the new president promised uh, leniency towards uh, uh, talking to the west to try to use diplomacy but i mean uh, uh, president uh, uh, the former president before Raisi, president uh, rouhani tried that and it was a total failure and Sayyid Ali Khamenei already told them that the JCPOA will not work because the Americans will not keep their promise. And that's exactly what happened when Trump became president. And now uh, he was asked, the new president was asked about the G JCPOA and he said that we've tried that, we might try something else now because that failed. We're not going to go back to a failed uh, agreement. So mm -hmm. no one knows how things will go from here, but for sure, when it comes to the resistance, this is part of the Iranian foreign policy. It's not going to change, especially because of elections. Will the US change if Trump comes instead of Biden? They will keep supporting Israel. So why is it so hard for them to understand that Iran will keep supporting the resistance even if a president is changed? No, oh, sure. Um, uh, I think, uh, Iran uh, gonna make whatever strength, strong position that he, it must do, but at the same time, uh, Iran never goes to fall with the, without the help of uh, Russia or China. They three, both three, are joined together in the in a final destiny, and uh, and this is a strong position for me that uh, is. Uh, make uh, they trying to to go and spread the war for uh, for Israel uh, uh, a madness in, in reality. Well, do you have some question that you I'll want? just have a question for Marwa as well. Um, talking about Iran, I would like to know what she thinks about the uh, inside of Iran and the use of uh, or where of his job. Some people say that it's changing. Some people say that this president. Uh, could see or have a different perspective of the use of hijab inside of Iran. Do you think it would be any difference? Well, I don't know if you saw the first lady. She's a hijabi wearing a abaya, not a normal hijab, a full abaya. That's the first lady, that's the wife of the president. So whatever he thinks about hijab, that's for him and that's for the Iranian people to vote for. But if you haven't been to Iran lately, I advise you to go because uh, I was there two months ago and I was there even two years ago. Two years ago when I was walking down the streets of Iran, of Tehran specifically, women were not wearing the hijab. They had scarves on their shoulders but they were not wearing the hijab. I went into a mall, I saw crop tops. I'm not saying that's progression. That for me as a Muslim woman, I don't like seeing that. But it's not my choice to tell what other women what to wear. And I think if the Iranians want to vote on a new law that goes into parliament where they can actually, uh, if they have a referendum over the issue and they choose to make hijab non-compulsory, that's their choice. And if they vote and choose to keep hijab compulsory or at least as it is now, meaning that in areas that where religious sites are, you have to wear a hijab, that's the same thing in Saudi Arabia. That's the same thing if you go to the Kaaba, if you go to the uh, pilgrimage, you have to be wearing on your head. If you go to a church in Syria, you have to put something on your head. So that's respect for the religious sites. If they vote to keep that respect for religious sites, that's their issue. If they vote to completely take it off, that's their issue. And if they vote to keep it as this, that's an internal Iranian issue that I really have no say and really don't care about. What I care about is if I go to another country and they oblige me to take it off. That's what I care about. For me, as a Muslim woman, did, I don't want it, anyone did, to tell any woman to what to wear or not to wear. Did yes, it happened to me in Uganda. They wanted to take, it to, they wanted me to take off my hijab so they could take a photo for the visa. And 
if I go to France, for example, I've been to Italy. I swam with my burkini in the in the Mediterranean. I went to uh, Greece. I swam in my burkini in the Mediterranean. If I go to France, I'm not allowed to swim because I'm covering my head. I don't know what they do in the winter. Do they go down scuba diving in the winter, or they also don't cover anything while scuba diving? It's ridiculous. That's what I what I what I am concerned about. I'm not concerned if Iran or Saudi Arabia or other uh, Arab and Muslim countries change their laws or not. What I want is equality for chances, for opportunities in uh, medicine, in in education, in uh, workplace. That's what I want. Why would I care what anyone wears or doesn't wear on their head or on their body? I don't care. Well, I, I think uh, I would find out for this uh, talking could be that if you both. Uh, ask each other one question. Sure, sure. I'd love to ask uh, uh, Tim because you've been in Venezuela before. Did you see something different than the trip, the the trip before at this time? Uh, do you think that uh, after this election we might see another wave of uh, violence on the streets of Venezuela? Not particularly Caracas, maybe other uh, areas. There's always the possibility of violence here because the. As uh, President Nicholas was saying today, the opposition has become extremely embedded in fascism and committed to coups and attempts at assassination and so on. What I noticed a difference really was not so much this year, but two years ago from ten years ago, is that the embeddedness of the Bolivarian Revolution, and including the principles of the Constitution, are in the institutions now. They're in the police, they're in the army. When there was big rallies two years ago, there were a lot of civilians in arms. There was a very big militia here, millions of people under arms. So they were coming to the big rallies now um, in uniform. You know, so that that's different in a way. It's, um, it's because, of course, Venezuela has faced such a lot of coup attempts and invasions. You know, from Bush through to Trump, basically. Um, and, and as the president was saying, several assassination attempts earlier this year. That really they've had to solidify some of the institutions in face of this constant pressure, and I, and I think they have to. Every state, every independent state in the world, has to become what the U.S. sees as a dictatorship. Because if not, they'll be destroyed. If they are weak liberal democracies, they will be simply overturned. Basically, they have to. They have to really have a strong state to resist this pressure to crush and, and destroy and incorporate all of the independent states in the world. And that's why they call them dictatorships because they. They don't give in. They, they, they maintain their position. Yeah. Well, your question for her. Your last. My question for Mawa is: um, I hope you can get back home and look after your girls. You know, because uh, the country is facing terrible aggression at the moment, and um, I know some people want the war to widen, but uh, no one really is advantaged by a war widening. It's terrible. You know, there's going to be a war. It should be short and sharp, and you know, all of those, all of those Zionists. Weapons, batteries, and, and, and planes should be knocked out in one hit if there's to be a, an effective war. No one wants to see a protracted war. It's going to hurt all of our friends and, and relatives. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I completely see what you're saying, and I I uh, second your your idea that no one really wants war. But with a Zionist entity that has been committing genocide over the past ten uh, months, uh, it's been now clear and exposed to the whole world that. They only understand power. They understand nothing but power, which is why up until now they haven't attacked Beirut, for example. The only thing is deterrence, power. It's stopping them from attacking us, killing more Lebanese civilians. And uh, I wish that we could say the same about Gaza, but this, the resistance is still viable and it's still strong in Gaza and we support it at every angle and we support it before uh, Al-Aqsa flood, during and after Al-Aqsa flood. And we'll continue to support it even after the day after uh, uh, the war on Gaza. But Lebanon, in specific, is a very uh, exclusive case. You know, it's a very uh, uh, important case of how uh, the people and the resistance merge together to face an occupation, kick it out, liberate the land, and then basically make up a new form of resistance that is embedded in the communities, not only as military resistance, but also as social and uh, political resistance, uh, to, which allowed Hezbollah to become such a powerful uh, force of resistance in the region and become a leading force in the axis of resistance against, against, uh, against the Zionist Israelis alongside Syria, Iraq, uh, Iran, and, uh, and Yemen. And uh, the possibility of an increasing uh, spectrum of more factions joining in 
is, is being seen. We're seeing it in the horizon at the moment. We've seen in Egypt the newcomers who, are, who named themselves the Muhammad Salah Resistance Brigades. We've seen in Libya uh, some forces who said we want to part of the, uh, uh, be part of the resistance. And uh, I think that this is a movement that will sweep across the Arab world and hopefully the Islamic world. This is our time, Tim. It's our time to regain power back to where it belongs, to the just, natives. Just exactly. And whether or not I make it back home, whether swimming or <laughs> actually taking a different route, a different flight, I'm going to make it back home. And uh, whether or not uh, uh, my people are safe, I have full faith that we will win this. No matter the price, we are the natives. We will win this. And you're passing from a resistant context in Latin America to another resistant context, context in the Arab-speaking world. So yeah. I think it's very emblematic. Thank you very much for my pleasure and uh, viva Maduro, viva Venezuela, viva Cuba, Cuba, viva the entire uh, Latin Americas against imperialism. May the people be able to determine their own uh, uh, rights that, to, to self-determination, to sovereignty, to uh, ruling, to their own resources away from the hands of imperialism, no matter what that imperialism is. And basically viva the people. The people are the essence of every revolution and that's where our faith resides. Well, Palestina will be free from the river to the sea. We will win. Uh, and the Zionist is about to disappear. What's the word? Sanam Sanam We will be victorious. And Venezuela too. Well, but we are in free land now. Yeah. Okay. From this free land, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. Thank you. 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 Thank you.